Eggs. In the afternoon, we looked over our shoulders and hit three cartons underneath the topiary. That night, we watched The Godfather, rewinding the tollbooth scene over and over to see Sonny Corleone filled with holes and tap dancing over his car door. Though, we were bored by Michael in Italy, happy to see it explode. Wife, car, and all. Four in the morning, a carton to a man, we pummeled the house, loud like the Tommy guns through Sonny's Lincoln. I ran around to hit the side, windows and gutters, while Nate hammered the garage, the new car. Jack planted on the grass out front, aiming good ones at the mailbox, the screen door, until the upstairs light flared on and the woman ran out front, her bathrobe flapping wild over her shoulder, howling across the lawn. You little shit! You little shit! Mike! Mike, wake up! I'm calling the police! <laughs> Fifteen years old. The terror of all things. We ducked into the woods and cop cars shot down the avenue. They handled their flashlights like blind men with canes. But we were too good, too hidden, in the cozy trees with our sudden wants. Louder now than they had ever been, desires found at the end of our throwing arms. No more gangster movies. From broken shells sprang a world of escapes, of cars and beautiful women going up in flames. Yeah. That was too much, I'm sorry. I remember, after Joe Brainerd, I remember lying in the shadow of the side of my garage, very dark. We were by the tomato plants. He urged me to be quiet so our parents wouldn't hear. I remember I was about four, so he must have been 11 or 12. I don't remember how it started. I never remember it being malicious. I remember so infrequently that mostly I forget. It is a little box tucked behind my lungs. I remember that clothes were always on, except for once. And I had never seen anyone like that besides my father. It was warm to the touch. I don't know what I expected it to be, but I didn't like it and refused to do anything else. So he stopped, looking at me sadly for a moment. He was so much hairier than me like a small forest swallowing him. I don't remember being scared, but maybe I was. I remember laying on top of him, belly to belly, fully clothed, and moving my hips back and forth, grinding hardness. It wasn't unpleasant. I remember he smelled like earth and vague body odor, probably like most adolescents. I remember my mother tucking me in and asking, what happened, what were you two doing? knowing I was lying to her. I remember having a terrible cough and it raining and going to a therapist but not really understanding what she was or why I was there. This is where I played shoots and ladders for the very first time and if I remember correctly that's all we ever did. I remember our parents were friends for some years before drifting apart. When we all got together he was conspicuously absent but it was always explained very simply to me. Oh, he's at his cousin's house, or he's at camp. I remember even then knowing full well that was false, but never thinking much of it or acknowledging it to myself. Instead, I sat there playing my Game Boy and eating potato chips while our parents continued like nothing happened. When Philip Seymour Hoffman died, needle in his arm like a stop sign in the snow, and the owner of everyone's favorite hot dog joint was bent backward by the bumper of a truck, people wept. There were shrines in LA and the grit of Cleveland, reeking of French fry grease. Meanwhile, in a far corner of Queens, the old man who rasped that he'd barbecue my kitten fell asleep in a hospital bed to dream of fine scotch and being a young man in Poland, in love. Warsaw's blooming trees, wind, and the hair of the woman who bore him sons. In the vast chemistry of death, I find this appropriate, a balanced equation. For every overdose, every thunderbolt, a creeping heaviness takes dozens and stops for nothing. No amount of candles lit or tchotchkes bought, no whisper, no prayer, no pacing naked in the dark, 
No obscure angel. One is just sick. Green thick gunk in the lungs. The slow blood slinking to the far corners of the body to end it like an animal. Yes, my great aunt's heart seized and burst. Yes, she spent her last moments crawling to the phone. And yes, I did watch when my mother stroked her wide eyes closed. But here's what I remember more. The all-night wheeze of a ventilator down the hall. A shrinking old man who ate dinner with a picture of his late wife. A woman smearing waste on bathroom walls, knife in hand, screaming at her daughter. Every weekend, the man down the street with kidney disease was taken to the hospital by several impassive men in white. His wife nibbled valleys in her fingernails. I was too young to know who I could and could not stare at, so of course I did. <laughs> to have fun in the suburbs. <laughs> Adolescence in a place so sterile, all central air and picket fences forced one to improvise. Stealing traffic cones was fun, and without older brothers to sell us weed, we smoked tea out of printer paper joints, never expecting to feel anything, but glad to have something to cough on. Creek walking was the best distraction. We vied for angriest mother and Lewis and Clark to the tiny river sinking our good shoes into mud-brown water that dried like blood around our legs. And it was a marvel. Beds of shale layered like church steps, always cool to the touch. Lightning-felled trees slept like ruins, and once, in a creekside yard, we found a housewife's stash under a rock, cigarettes, and an old Christmas card that said, test for positive, say a prayer, Mary Xmas, dad. We laughed and swore and threw big rocks into the water because it made us feel older than we really were. The smells of the earth quickened me, roasting coffee and the faint rot of deer shit. Wandering one particularly ripe day, Nate and Steve, panicked, stopped me with my own name. Eric! Eric! Look down! Two feet in front of me, a pig, the size of a park bench and absolutely dead. It lay as if resting, without regard for the flow of water or anyone's sweet time, while a mother duck and her brood continued their neat journey around the corpse. It smelled sour, it stung, but we stayed with it a while. Its mouth open in a snarl or a snore, we couldn't tell, and the finely plump body, not yet waterlogged, almost clean looking in the sun. Later, I tried to tell people I'd, I'd never seen anything so but my voice caught and I came up continually empty-handed you know I, I, I just have never seen anything so until I realized it was just that I've never seen anything <laughs> uh, felony summer perhaps it was the clarity each and every yard my own, the absoluteness of self in the still air, and my Swiss army knife purring through bug screens. First, a walk around the living room to admire the furnishings, making sure to take my shoes off. And 15 minutes later, me and a stolen green bottle on the altar of a church, spitting champagne out of my mouth like a cherub in a fountain. Wasn't there some kind of truth there? To step out the back door and wander into the crickety night, Nothing but a lighter in hand was my greatest pleasure. I crawled in thick hedges, belly in the dirt, while headlights passed over me, yawning around the corner. I brought the kiss of flame to fabric and watched the slow balding of flagpoles. One American flag hung from a garage so high I had to climb on a station wagon to reach the striped tail. It torched, and I lost myself in its light, too late to notice the smell of a burning plastic trash can. Leaping through forests, over fences, my shoulder through a locked shed door, a bucket, a swimming pool, and I stood over the blackened, steaming husk, just me and the hiss of cold water. I caught my breath listening to the distant hiccups of frogs. Everyone was asleep. No light flared up in windows. The deer raised their heads to the coming wind, and I weaved home between the same trees.
compromise elsewhere for boar's head cold cuts. <laughs> I spend my days in a bookstore helping shrunken grandmothers reach nicotine-stained romance novels, old lottery tickets pressed in them like leaves. All the while, I'm dreaming of my sandwich in the back room, heavy with salt and spice juice to run down my chin. A nourishing thing, one to remain heavy within me through the interminable drive home, the croon of radio traffic like a folk song memorized. I-90 is running slow, West 25th is slow, Prospect is slow. I am inching toward an existence where I wake to my wife's rancid sleep breath and roll out of bed, past my snoring children who care most about high fructose corn syrup and multicolored ad campaigns, and wander into the kitchen where the refrigerator holds my only solace of finely processed sinew and muscle, perfectly tender and the color of blood. Raymond Carver's change jar. Someone once told me that William Blake, alone in the woods, was the only happy poet in the profession's history. <laughs> yeah, bullshit, right? But I don't believe them because of you, Raymond Carver. Here you are at your desk, watching the sailboats on the strait. Every day, you rise from dreamless sleep with a woman whom you love without pretense who cuts your hair after quiet dinners of salmon caught that afternoon and cleaned in the sink. You hunt the occasional bobcat, and sometimes remember when you pawned your girlfriend's black and white television, or you and your brother behind the wheel sharing the bottle of ten high you'd stashed in the glove compartment, certain that, any minute, something would happen. You do not forget the way you battered Marianne, and your relatives continue to write, demanding your money. Daily, you recall that this is not a thing you have stumbled upon. It is not a one-sided serendipity, a lottery ticket, or genetic blessing, but a long-term chore, something that you've grown, like dropping change into a bottle of whiskey, remembering all too well the echo when it's empty. Ron James and the ten-year-old with wings. He plunges into the paint like a depth charge, sledgehammer arm putting the ball to bed with that final, concise clunk before the fall, the wicked grin, and the crowd and opera of screams or funereal choir. <laughs> the announcers have nothing to say except, he's a bad, bad man. <laughs> I was not. But I stood in his birthday gift shoes many Saturday afternoons, desperate to fly above the blue gymnasium, watching beautiful, long-limbed eighth graders take off like planes in a thunderstorm. My tryout was memorably abysmal. I bounced the ball out to nothing, picked it up, started over four times before heaving it in a swan dive up and over, not even kissing the net. <laughs> I started playing in jeans, God knows why, graduated to sweatpants, then athletic shorts, and finally, Gatorade, begging my parents every weekend for that colorful magic. Somehow I did this for years. I don't remember loving it, just practicing every day. Now, I think it was the moodiness of the game, those fits and spurts. A pale kid with bad posture could suddenly be a giant, perfect footwork and finger rolls before tumbling down to the gym floor again. Once, a point guard plowed into me and crumbled. I stood there, my arms up like a bank robber. The guard's father made a megaphone with his hands and shouted, Nick, what the fuck are you doing? Before I passed the ball to the wrong team. I never became a great basketball player. I can only make threes when no one is looking. I have what I need to succeed in the post, except perhaps an extra foot of height. But those Saturdays return to me on my morning train, or in the deep woods on the edge of sleep. Shit. Hold on! Dreams in which my palm snaps forward like a well-oiled catapult. The swish of net like the sound of a candle blown out. And sometimes I see my arms stretched out before me. My hands stuck to those orange goosebumps like a starfish. I am stretching forward toward the bright metal halo and the wonderful calm pain when I slam the ball through. 
reminding myself that I am a bad, bad man. <laughs> Thank you. Nice